Um, now we are moving on. We uh, until yesterday we studied the Genesis genealogy. Mm -hmm. I know there are many other things that we need to cover, but um, it'll just take too long to do all that. So we're going to move on to the next section, and we are studying from book two of the History of Redemption series, and that book is called The Covenant of the Torch. And we will be studying about the wilderness journey today. The wilderness journey. So please turn in your handouts to the wilderness journey. And we will get started. So we all know the story about the wilderness journey, right? You know, if you're if you're older than me, then you've seen Charlton Heston in the Ten Commandments. <laughs> if you're younger than me, then you've seen what is that? The Prince of Egypt, that animation film. <laughs> so we all know the story, right? The Exodus, wilderness journey, entry into Canaan. What does that mean? What this happened? about 3,500 years ago. So why do we need to know this? We're living in the 21st century. Why do we need to know why, what the Israelites did in the wilderness? If an unbelieving friend asked you, what is this Moses' story in the wilderness all about? What would you say? Yeah, what is that? Why do we need to know that? It's just history? Is that it? Life of wandering. Life of wandering? Okay. What Preparation. Preparation? Anybody else? Hmm? See miracles of God. Miracles of God. Okay. You're all touching on some peripheral stuff, but you're not getting the, the, the essence of it. What's the wilderness journey about? Journey of faith. Journey of faith, okay. What else? Depending on God. Depending on God, right? Faith matters. Punishment. Punishment. Surrender. Process of molding. Process of molding. Molding, yes, yes. Okay, good, good. But I mean, we want to be able to just get at the heart of it with the right words, right? And just say, this is what it is. What does the Bible say? In order to understand the Old Testament, what do we need to do? We need to understand what the New Testament writers said about the Old Testament. We, need, we have to depend on the interpretation of the New Testament writers. What did the New Testament writers say about the wilderness? Their interpretation is accurate, right? Because they've been guided by the Holy Spirit. Don't just imagine, oh, I think the wilderness journey is about this. You know, in America, it's all about what I think. For me, the wilderness, well, I don't care what you think. What does God say, right? What do the, old, uh, the New Testament writers say? say about the wilderness journey. So let's look at some verses. First, let's go to Acts chapter 7, verse 38. Acts chapter 7, verse 38. So Acts chapter 7, verse 38 says, this is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness, together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers, and he received living oracles to pass on to you. So here, Stephen talks about the congregation in the wilderness. Right? The word for congregation in Greek here is ecclesia. 
I'm sure you've all heard of that word, right? Yes. What does ecclesia mean? Assembly. Assembly, congregation. But what else? Church. What's the common word for it? Church. church. Church, right? Ecclesia is church, right? So there was a church in the wilderness. Did you guys know that? There was a church in the wilderness. Ecclesia in Greek means ones who are called out from, right? Ecclesia means what? Ones who are called out from. So what is the church? Church is a gathering of people who are called out from the world to become the people of God. That's who we are, right? Amen? And the Israelites in the wilderness were the same thing. There were people who were called out from Egypt to become a covenant people of God. So, what is the wilderness journey all about? Those 40 years in the wilderness, the wilderness journey is a foreshadowing of our life in the church. Okay, the wilderness journey is what? It's about our life in the church. So it, it has a direct application to us right now, today. Because everybody here goes to church, right? Who doesn't go to church? Please don't raise your hand. <laughs> everybody goes to church, right? So that means we're all, spiritually speaking, we're all in the wilderness right now. This is about you and me. That's why it's very important for us to understand this. So, the wilderness is the church. It's about our life in the church. And the people, the Israelites in the wilderness were people who were called out from where? Huh? From Egypt. From Egypt, right? Egypt. They were called out from Egypt. And then they crossed the Red Sea. Went into the wilderness. And they crossed the Jordan. And then entered Canaan, right? Right? Yes. Alright. So the wilderness we just learned is the church. It symbolizes our life in the church, according to Acts chapter 7, verse 38. What about crossing the Red Sea? Let's all turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. We're looking at what the New Testament writers, or how the New Testament writers interpreted the wilderness journey, right? So 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. 1 through 4 says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, right, the Red Sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Right there. What does it say? Crossing the Red Sea was what? Was them being baptized. It was a baptism for the Israelites. Everybody here been baptized? If not, there's a swimming pool over there we could baptize you. Right now. What does baptism mean for us? When you get baptized, you are now what? You're newborn, but also you are now part of the church. See, look at what well, it's the same thing. When they crossed the Red Sea, that was a baptism, and then they entered into the wilderness. They're now part of the wilderness church. Right? So what is Egypt then? What were they before they crossed the Red Sea when they were living in Egypt? They were slaves. Right? What were we before we were baptized into Christ? We were slaves to sin. Weren't we? We were slaves to sin. Whether you knew it or not, you were all, and I was too, we were all slaves to sin. Before we found Christ and we were baptized into Him. The Israelites were slaves in Egypt. 
What does Egypt mean for us? What does it symbolize for us now? The what? The world, right? Let's go to Revelation chapter 11, verse 8. Revelation chapter 11, verse 8. It says, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city. The great city here is Babylon. Right? If you read the entire book of Revelation, you will realize that it's Babylon the great. Right? The great city. So their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Does this make sense? Where was Jesus crucified? Jerusalem, right? Not in Egypt, not in Sodom, not in Babylon. But spiritually, spiritually where Jesus died is Babylon, it is Sodom, and it is Egypt. So I, I, this, I'm going to write a formula. Sodom equals Egypt equals Babylon. And all three of these things all equal the fallen world. That's where our Lord died, right? Because of our sins in the fallen world. Sodom, Egypt, Babylon all symbolize the fallen world. Spiritually. Okay? So... And then Canaan, obviously, we, what is Canaan? It symbolizes the kingdom of heaven, right? That's the promised land, right? Okay, thank you. So, now we have a full picture here. The Israelites were slaves in Egypt. But then Moses came and said, let my people go. <laughs> and God let them go. They crossed the Red Sea, they got baptized, and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, being trained to be set apart people of God. And then finally they crossed the Jordan and entered into the Promised Land, the Kingdom of God. So this is a picture of our life of faith. We were once sinners living as slaves to sin in the world. We met Jesus. We were saved, we got baptized, we entered the church. And now, right now, we are being trained up to become God's holy people. To live a life that is set apart for God, right? In the church, in the wilderness right now. So spiritually speaking, we are right now walking through the wilderness. Headed towards the promised land. Right? That's why... This wilderness journey is so very important for us to understand. We need to know what it is because it's about us and our life right now. Amen? Amen. All right. So let's get into it. The wilderness journey. See this map right here? This is a map that is in the book called The Covenant of the Torch. That this map is a one of a kind. You won't find it anywhere. And I've looked in many places. No map has this much detail about the wilderness journey. How many, how many years did the Israelites spend in the wilderness? 40 years. How many times did they camp in the wilderness? 20? 30? 22? 22 or 42? 42, right? To be exact, they camped 41 times in the wilderness, and the last one, Gilgal, was in Canaan, right? But 42 times altogether. 40 years, 42 camps. What does that mean? So let's look at our handouts. Reverend Abraham Park, the author of this book, divided those 42 campsites into five sections to help explain the meaning of all this. Okay? So section one goes from Sukkoth, the first campsite, all the way to Rephidim, which is the tenth campsite. 
Section 2 uh, goes from wilderness of Sinai to Hazarot. Section 3 from Rithma to Izion Geber. Section 4 from Kadesh to Ye Avarim. And Section 5, Deben Gad to Gilgal. So we're going to go through these sections, all five sections, and study them today during the next, this lecture and the next lecture. So, when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt from here, the first place they went to was Sukkoth. And then at Etham, before Migdal, they crossed the Red Sea, came down like this, and went to Mount Sinai. Just before Mount Sinai, this is the first section right here. So, what do we need to know about this first section? What is the wilderness? Not spiritually speaking, like physically, what is the wilderness? Desert. It's desert, right? So what does that mean? Wilderness, basically in the Bible, wilderness is defined as a place that is uninhabitable by human beings. Okay? Wilderness is a place where human beings cannot survive. You can't live there. Because it's the desert. There's no water. It's hot. There's no food. There's nothing. You cannot survive there. That's what the wilderness is. Okay? But God led the Israelites into the wilderness. Why would He do that? I think somebody said it before, right? So that we will learn to trust only in God. It's the best place to train us up to trust in God because otherwise we would all die. The wilderness is a place where man cannot survive on his own. So, the Israelites knew this when Moses was leading them into the wilderness. So in their minds, there was one question, or a couple of questions. They're walking into the wilderness. You know these Israelites are always grumbling. <laughs> They're always full of doubt. So what do you think they were thinking as they were entering into the wilderness? What was in their minds? What, if it were you, what would you be thinking? We're going to die. Huh? We're going to die. Is God crazy? But let's be more realistic. You have to go. There's no other way. The Egyptians are chasing behind you. you got to go. This is the only way in. Now we have to be realistic about it. What, what, what do you think of? What's the... What's the huh? Go back. <laughs> no, you can't go back. You have to go. <laughs> now you got to live in the wilderness. There's no reset button. What's the first thing that you're going to think of? How am I going to live? How am I going to survive? Right? But more specifically. Huh? Water. What else? Food. Shelter. Exactly. Now we're getting realistic here. <laughs> These are the things that they were worried about. Is there going to be water? Is there going to be food? Is there going to be shelter? Is there going to be protection? Do we know where to go? There's no roads there. Guidance. These are the things that the Israelites were all worried about. So if you turn the page, that sentiment is recorded by the psalmist in Psalm chapter 78 verse 19. Then they spoke against God. They said, what did they say? Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? That's what the Israelites said. Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Is He going to feed us? Are we going to have enough water to drink? How many people actually came out? Do you guys know? How many people? How many Israelites were actually? 600,000. 600,000, very close. The exact number, I want you to memorize this, or we're going to be tested on it. <laughs> 603,550. Men only. That's in the book of Numbers, right? Numbers chapter 1. They took the census of men 20 years old and over. Why men only, and why 20 years old and older? It was a military census. They wanted to know how many people could actually go out and fight in battle. And the number was 603,550. So imagine men over age of 20 and, you know, young enough to fight. So that means they didn't count the elderly, they didn't count the children, they didn't count women. 
So if you combine all of that, how many, how much, how many people do you think? Two million, two and a half million. Okay. Two million people went through the wilderness. Moses had to lead two million people. Can you imagine that? Having a hard time leading a hundred people. <laughs> so the first question in their mind was, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? So in the first section, God is going to address those issues. What issues are they? Can, can I get my iPad up, please? The issues in the first section is this. Provision, like water, food, shelter, protection, and guidance. God is going to address these immediate concerns in the first section of the wilderness journey. So, before we get into that though, so when they came out here at the second campsite, what happened at Ethel? This is in Exodus chapter 13. The pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire first appeared here and met the Israelites here. And from this point, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire led the Israelites throughout the 40-year wilderness journey. Never left them. The pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire symbolized the presence of God. Right? During the day, cloud was a cover, shading them from the sun. At night, the pillar of fire was light and heat and warmth for the Israelites. It met them here. Why? You know why? Why here? Why not here? Because this is the edge of the wilderness. This is where the wilderness actually begins. So called is still part of Egypt, actually. So God is very accurate. Started right here, right at the edge of the wilderness, met with them here, and he guided them and led them throughout the four-year journey. So there are three ways to go from Egypt to Canaan. Okay? Three ways, three paths. That there are like the three paths that everybody took. The first is right here, the way of the land of the Philistines. But immediately in Exodus chapter 13, verse 17, from the beginning, God said, I'm not going to go this way because the Philistines are here and you're going to have to fight them. And if the Israelites see war, they're going to be afraid and they're going to want to go back to Egypt. So I'm not going to take them this way. So he came down this way to Sukkot. Sukkoth is right on the second path, the second way, which is right here. The second way is called the way of Shur. It goes like this. So here the Israelites thought, oh, maybe we're going to go this way. But no, he went down. And then the third way is here, the way of Mount Seir. Right? This is the third and final way. There's no other roads after this. Okay? So the Israelites naturally thought, Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. So the Israelites naturally thought, coming down from Ethan like this, they all thought, oh, we're going to go this way, because there's no other way after that. So they turned, actually. They were going to go that way. And what did God say? Let's turn to Exodus chapter 14, verse 2. Exodus chapter 14, verse 2. This is what God said to Moses. Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before Pihahiroth, between Migdol and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon. You shall camp before it by the sea. So here, God is saying, turn. Help them turn. Don't go this way. Have them turn and go south to right here, right before the Red Sea. Okay. You see, God turned, told him to turn because the Israelites had already turned this way. They were assuming that, oh, we're obviously going this way. 
So God made them turn back and come down like this. Why is that important? Because right here, this is like you're trapped. You have the Red Sea in front of you. There are mountains here. You can't really cross over this way. So you're stuck. You're in a corner. And what happened? The Pharaoh heard this, right? Pharaoh heard now that they were stuck in the wilderness. They're lost. He probably heard the report saying, oh, they're lost. They're like sun tanning at the Red Sea. <laughs> <laughs> so what did Pharaoh do? Now he thought, okay, this is my chance. So he came chasing after them. So the Red Sea is in front of them, mountains here, Egyptians chasing with chariots behind them. They're stuck. Why would God lead them this way? This is the question. Why did God lead them this way? This, what did the Israelites do? They, what they always do? They grumbled and complained, right? What did they say? They said, were there not enough graves in Egypt that you dragged us out here so we would die in the wilderness? Right? But what God said was, Tell them to just stand still and see the glory of God. You don't have to do anything. I will do everything. And you will see the salvation of God. So sometimes in our lives, God leads us into the corner where it seems like we have no way out. Have you guys ever felt that? And you start complaining to God? But that's the time when you can truly see the glory of God. This is what God is trying to train us to be able to see and believe in, in our lives. That's what the wilderness is all about. He makes a way where there is no way, right? He did it on purpose. Okay, right here. And before Migdol. Not only that, there are many other reasons for this. So here, by bringing them here, he would enable the Israelites to see the Red Sea parting. He would show them his glory and his power. But also, he would drown the Egyptian army here, right? Why is that important? Because if that doesn't happen... The Egyptians will be looming behind them throughout the journey. They're always going to be worried. Are they going to chase after us again? Are they coming after us again? They would always be worried about that. So here, he would just put an end to that worry and concern once and for all. Okay? And Apostle Paul said the crossing the Red Sea was what? Baptism, right? What is baptism? When you go down into the water, that signifies your union with Christ in His what? Death. When, you're go, go, when you go down into the water, that is what? That's you, the former self, dying. That is you being united to the death of Christ. And then when you come up, what does that mean? That is your new self. Your union to the resurrection of Christ. Right? So, baptism is death and resurrection. Somebody has to die. Who died here? <coughs> the Egyptians died. Okay? And it's funny because after they crossed, God made them turn back and look at it. Right? Let's go to uh, Exodus chapter 14, verse 30. So after they crossed the Red Sea, it says this, So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. God showed it to them. Look. Hey, look. Those are your former masters. Right? They were slaves to these Egyptians, right? That, those are your former masters. What does that mean now? God is saying, now you're mine. You're no longer theirs. Now you're mine. See? And now that your former self is dead, you are no longer slaves of Egypt, now you are chosen people of God. 
Okay? So that's what happened here at the Red Sea. And then, so now they're going down. Down, 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 down. A lot of, a lot of events here. At Mara, what happened? They found water, but it was bitter. So what did they do? God told them to find a, a piece of tree and throw it into the water. Right? And the water became sweet, right? That tree symbolizes the cross of Jesus Christ. When you have the cross in your life, everything is sweet. Amen? And Ellen, they had 12 uh, you know, springs and 70 palm dates, etc. And then seventh, the wilderness of sin. What happened here? What happened at the wilderness of sin? The word sin here doesn't mean sin. It's just a Hebrew word for this, the name of this place. So what happened at the wilderness of sin? Anybody know? Bonus points? Food? Manna. Thank you. Manna started to rain down here. Exactly one month after they left. They left on the 15th day of the first month. By the 15th day of the second month, they arrived at the wilderness of sin. According to Exodus chapter 16 verse 1, right? And it says that they ran out of food. So that means they packed enough food for about a month. Why? Because this journey here is only a couple of weeks by walking. It shouldn't take that long. So they prepared food for only one month. And they ran out of food here. And what do they do? What do, what do people do when they run out of food? They complain, obviously. And what did God say? Oh, don't worry, I will rain down food from heaven starting tomorrow. You know what's interesting? What was the rule of gathering manna? One day's portion every day. Don't gather too much. Because if you leave it overnight, what happens? It's going to spoil and smell, right? So every day you get one, get one day's portion, every single day, except on what day? <laughs> the sixth day, which is Friday, Friday, the day before the Sabbath, you gather how much? Twice as much, right? Because on the Sabbath, there will be none. Don't go out, right? So the... On the 15th of the second month, they ran out of food, they complained, God said, tomorrow I will rain down manna for you. And these are the rules. For five days, you gather one day's worth. On the sixth day, you gather twice as much because the day after that is the Sabbath. You know why this is important? Now you have a calendar. When the manna came down, what day of the week was it? Sunday. Sunday, one day's worth. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then on Friday, twice as much. On Saturday, there's no man. Now you have calendar. So in the eighth book, which also covers it, the, the wilderness journey, Reverend Abraham Park figured out from that one incident, he went back and forth and figured out all the dates and the days of the week when all these events happened. So they left. The exodus took place on the 15th day of the first month. That was a Thursday. Did you guys know that? They crossed the Red Sea on the 21st day of the first month. That was a Wednesday. Right? You can figure all of that out. It's in the Bible. So why did, why did God have the Israelites gather manna like this? What's the purpose? What do you think? Why do you think he had the Israelites gather manna like this? He's training them to training them to do what? Huh? Depend on him, yeah. But there's something specific here. On the sixth day, twice as much. On the seventh day, you rest. You do this, repeat this every week, over and over again for 40 years, for 2,084 weeks. He gave them manna like this. Observe the Sabbath day. There you go. God's training them to keep the Sabbath using manna. How many, uh, how many of you have pets? Dogs? Cats? How do you train your dog? With food, right? That's the easy way to train animals. Same thing with people. You train them with people with food, right? Here you go, good boy, good boy. No food on the seventh day, good boy. Oh, 
I'm serious. He's trained them to keep the Sabbath. Because in Egypt, for 430 years, they were unable to keep the Sabbath. Now he's trying to train the Israelites to keep the Sabbath. That's how important it is to keep the Sabbath. For us now, the Christian Sabbath is the Lord's Day, right? Sunday. That's how important it is to keep the Sabbath. God trained them for 40 years to keep the Sabbath using the manna. Okay? And then so now the question is answered, right? Can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Yes. They had food left over. It was just overflowing. They didn't even have to work for it. And then finally, the tenth campsite is refitted. Two important events happened here at Rafidin. First is what? They ran out of water. So what did God have Moses do? He told Moses to strike the rock and it will pour forth water. Right? This is in Exodus chapter 17. This is the first time that water came out of the rock. So we've all heard this event. Oh yeah, Moses struck the rock and God brought us some water. How many people did I say came out in the Exodus? All together, about two million people. What else did they bring? Animals, right? They had livestock. Can you imagine how much water came out of the rock? Now think about that. The Bible says he brought forth a river from the rock. He brought a river out of the rock. That's how much water you need to feed 2 million people. And then the second incident that happened here at the Fidim is that the Amalekites attacked them from behind. So they had to fight their first battle. Did they win or not? Obviously they won, right? Why is that important? Who are these people? Did they have any military training? No, they were slaves. Unorganized. But they won. Because God was with them, right? Remember Moses, when he raised his hand, they would win. And when he got tired and put his hands down, they would lose. So Aaron and Hur held his hands up. And they won. And they built a, an altar called it Jehovah Nitzi, which means the Lord is my banner, right? So these slaves, untrained in military affairs, won this battle against the Malachites. So, there you go. God provided provision, protection, and guidance. God is letting them know, look, from the beginning, look, you just trust me, I'll get you whatever you need. Food, water, protection, guidance, everything you need, I can give you, if you just trust me and follow me. Amen? Amen. Alright, that's the first section. Now, once that's been settled, but it's not settled still in the Israelites' minds, even though God showed them proof. But anyways, it's, now that's been settled, the 11th campsite is the wilderness of Sinai. Let's go to uh, Exodus chapter 19, verse 1. Exodus 19, verse 1 says, in the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. So the English Bible just says on the third month, right? But in Hebrew, the word is Hodesh, Hodesh, which means, the word Hodesh literally means new moon. New moon. Okay? It comes from the root word, which means to renew, right? So why is that important? The Hebrews used a lunar calendar, right? And in their lunar calendar, the first day of the month is always the new moon day. So that means they arrived at Sinai on the first day of the third month. So literally what this verse would say in Hebrew is, on the third new moon, they arrived at Sinai. Okay? Sinai was the goal of the Exodus. Did you guys know that? Obviously Canaan is the goal, but the intermediate goal is Sinai. Because in Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, God said to Moses, 
This will be the sign that I sent for you. When you bring the Israelites out of Egypt and when you worship me here at this mountain, which is Sinai, then you'll know it was me. So God's original plan was from the beginning was to bring them first to Mount Sinai, make a covenant with them, give them the Ten Commandments, give them the tabernacle, and then go directly to Canaan. That was God's original plan. Okay? So this plan was this. From here, come down, make the Sinaitic covenant, Ten Commandments, tabernacle, take a census, and go into Canaan directly. That would have been it, just this, like a V. That's God's original plan. Did you guys know that? It wasn't supposed to be 40 years originally. Okay, we will see that. We're going to get to that. All right, so Sinai is very important. How long did they stay at Mount Sinai? They arrived on the first day of the third month in 1446 BC, and they left the next year, 1445 BC, on the 20th day of the second month. So that means they stayed there almost a year, 10 days less than a year, right? 11 months and 20 days. And what did they do here? They received the Sinaitic covenant, they received the Ten Commandments, they received the plans for the tabernacle and built the tabernacle. And God took the first census here. And that, that's where we get the number 603,550. Let's go to Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. When God made a covenant with the Israelites, this is, what, this is basically the content of the covenant. This is what he said. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Okay? So, God's promising three things here. You're going to be a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, and a special treasure. God's special treasure. My, my own possession. Your mind. When God ratified the Sinaitic covenant, that day was the, the third month, sixth day of the third month. Why is that important? The sixth day of the third month. In the Hebrew calendar, that, that is a, a feast called Shavuot. Shavuot. Have you ever heard of that? In the New Testament, that's called Pentecost. So in the New Testament, at Pentecost, what happened? The Holy Spirit came and the church was born. In the Old Testament, at Pentecost, what happened? The law was given and the nation of Israel was born. Same day. Okay? So at Shavuot, which is Pentecost... Exactly 50 days after they left. Right? Because they left on the, the, after Passover, right? They kept the Passover and they left that night. Pentecost is 50 days from Passover. So 50 days from Exodus, they received the covenant, they received the law, and they became a nation, a kingdom of priests, a nation of Israel. 50 days after the death of Jesus, Holy Spirit came, the church was born. The Bible is just filled with mystery, isn't it? It's amazing. This is what we should be reading every night. Don't watch TV. <laughs> this is so fun, right? <laughs> so, so that's what happened here at Sinai. I mean, we could go on. There's so many things that we could talk about at Sinai. For example, Moses went up the mountain, right? Moses was the only one who could go up to the top of the mountain to meet with God, speak to him face to face, right? How many times did Moses go up the Mount Sinai? How many times? Two times. Two times? How many of, has anybody been to Mount Sinai? No. I haven't been either, but I heard from people that went, it's really hard to climb up there. So they have to take camels, some of them. Like if you're a strong, you know, hiker, you can go up. 
But remember, Moses was how, how old at this time? He was 80 years old. And how many times did he go up and down Mount Sinai? Do you guys know? Reverend Abraham Park figured this out for the first time. Eight times. Eight times. Up and down, up and down, up and down. Eighty-year-old man went up Mount Sinai eight times. Each time there was a reason why God called him up. So, here at Sinai, they became a kingdom of priests. They became a nation. Because they received the law, right? A nation has to have laws. They took a census, which means now they have a military, right? And they received the tabernacle. The tabernacle was finished on the first day of the first month of 1445 BC. What is the tabernacle? It is the house of God, right? It symbolizes God's presence among them. It's like the king's palace. Right? Now it's showing that God is king over this nation. So at Sinai, now they have become God's people, holy nation. And then they were going to go straight up to Canaan. But then something happened, right? We'll continue that in the next lecture.